Uh, so first of all, you mentioned, see, so you saw at some point X, Y, and then uh, somebody in the Princeton said, you're not gonna believe this, sir. It's at your cap point. Now, that's a different place. How the heck did it know what your cap point is? That's a good question. That's you, you the one if you don't, no one, you know, you don't, we don't tell it. It's, we don't broadcast it. We have a waypoint in the system. That was retired commander David Fravor talking on the Lex Fridman show about his famous intercept with the Tic Tac. This video focuses on David Fravor's account of that day, really specifically about the Chad Underwood intercept when he actually recorded, Chad Underwood did, the FLIR 1 video that we have now. In this video, I cover a lot of questions I receive about the cap point. How did the Tic Tac know about the cap point? Did it know? Commander Fravor mentions jamming in this. I'll talk to you a little bit about radar jamming. And then finally go through with some visual representation of how Chad Underwood actually got the lock on that Tic Tac, the object, and got us the famous FLIR 1 video. Thanks for being here. Welcome to the channel. I'm Chris Slato, retired F-16 pilot turned UAP investigator, primarily because of this interview with David Fravor. Please hit that like button, subscribe for notifications of future videos. And if you want to support the channel, go to patreon.com forward slash Chris Lato. Thanks always to my patrons. Love you guys. Now let's get on to the video. First of all, you mentioned, see, so you saw at some point X, Y, and then uh, somebody in the Princeton said, you're not gonna believe this, sir. It's at your cap point. Now that's a different place. How the heck did it know what your cap point is? That's a good question. That's you, you the one if you don't, no one, you know, you don't, we don't tell it. It's, we don't broadcast it. We have a waypoint in the system. But I don't know, maybe it knew where we were going. Cause we use the same one day after day after day. Right, it's just um, it. But it, it obviously knew. But you we never going. saw it there. Never saw it there. Chad, when he took off, when he got the video, we landed, we told them, hey, look, we just, we just chased this thing. The cap point is, a, it stands for combat air patrol, right? It's normally an offensive hold point that we use to patrol an area. Okay, so normally it's just an orbit. You're gonna basically go in 10 mile legs. Normally it looks much like a hold. But now we're using our radars, we're using our sensors to look around with our aircraft and make sure there's nobody out there, right? And then we commit. So then you have certain uh, requirements for when you're going to commit and launch and effectively make an engagement against a, some other aircraft out there. A cap point in this instance is going to be where they go for their normal daily training. This is where they're training, okay? So he mentioned they're off the coast of San Diego. Okay, this is a large chart and this is area W291, Whiskey 291 is this very large area. Whiskey 291 is the largest component in the Navy inventory. It encompasses 113,000 square nautical miles located off of the Southern California coastline, extending from the ocean surface to 80,000 feet above sea level. Whiskey 291 supports aviation training and research and development test and evaluation conducted by all aircraft in the Navy and Marine Corps inventories. Conventional ordnance use is permitted. So the actual tactical maneuvering areas, which I think is where they're training, includes eight TMAs, tactical maneuvering areas, extending from 5,000 feet up to 40,000 feet MSL. That's sea level. Exercises conducted include air combat maneuvers, air control, air intercept control, air to air gunnery, and surface to air gunnery. Conventional ordnance use is permitted. So if we break up Whiskey 291 further, you'll see it's divided out into those tactical maneuvering areas they mentioned before, right? Papa 1 through 8. Fravor mentions that they're about 80 miles off the coast of San Diego. If you look down here, this is 40 nautical miles. Okay, so there, this is about 40 nautical miles to here. So this maybe is 80 nautical miles right in, in this area. So they're either in this area broken out, but more likely, I think they're operating in this main area. Okay, so this is a Fleta Hot, this yellow area, uh, is where they can actually use hot and ordnance, et cetera. So I think this is the area that they're fighting in. My guess is this is only 40 nautical miles long. Uh, they're probably doing air combat maneuvering. That's, it sounds like 2v1. So Fravor mentions that he's there with his wingman Dietrich. They're going out to do basic training. Doesn't necessarily say what that training is, but there is red air uh, and the red air is the Marine commander. And I'm not sure if he's a two ship or a single ship, but what that implies to me is that it's either basic intercepts, so 2v1 intercepts training up Dietrich, uh, but they don't have targeting pods. And normally on normal tactical intercept rides like that, we would train with the targeting pod. This could just be basic building block. But assuming that is all correct, they couldn't get the configurations they wanted on the aircraft, I think this is 2v1 dogfighting. 
So it's air combat maneuvering. They're gonna do some basic intercept and then go to uh, within visual range fighting. So it's practicing 2v1 dogfight. Could be incorrect, but the fact that they don't have targeting pods on the jets uh, for the blue air, financially, you know, I would think at least Dietrich would have a targeting pod on there for her to practice her targeting pod. And then if she has a targeting pod, most likely the instructor, which would have been Fravor in this instance, he would also have a targeting pod. So without targeting pods on their jets, so I think they're gonna go into this area here, TMA, Papa 5, south and north, and they're either gonna fight uh, in a north-south south fight. It sounded like they were going more east-west. Um, they could fight diagonal like this, or if it's a shorter setup, they can just fight uh, east-west in this area. He also mentions that we go to those areas and we use the same points basically every day. So, and that's what I think. These are standard training areas. I think they're gonna just pick a cap point here they're gonna use whatever's easiest, you know, so they don't flow out when they're in a hold. So it's probably a point right around here, uh, if I had to guess. Um, and then that is going to be where their cap point is. And that's probably the cap point for this area. If you went and looked up in the in-flight guide, just basic cap points for visiting, visiting uh, pilots, it's gonna have some cap point located right in this area. It's probably the same every time. So after Fravor's engagement with the Tic Tac, he runs out of gas. They don't have any targeting pods, so they can't get any good video of this thing. It disappears. Uh, they go back, they do their mission, like he mentioned. So I think they do their air combat mission, run out of gas, so they're not gonna have as much gas. You know, Potentially they complete the whole mission. As they're flying back, the controller on the Princeton now says, hey, that thing is back at your cap point. So cap point is basically where they started, where they started fighting. And so very, very interesting, when Fravor lands, he decides to tell Chad Underwood to go and get video of this thing. I don't know, maybe it knew where we were going, because we use the same one day after day after day. Right, just use um, it. But it, it obviously knew But you we never going. saw it there. Never for, saw it there. For, Chad, when he took off, when he got the video, we landed, we told them, hey, look, we just, we just chased this thing. And they're like, yeah. what? I go, chased <laughs> it. And they're like, what? I go, dude, he, I go, and I told him, I said, dude, get video. And he goes, and so, and that's how he is. He's like, oh, I'm going to go. And he, he was, he, he was determined that he was going to find this thing. So he goes out and when he first sees it, he gets a radar return on it because when he's not trying to lock it, so the radar's just throwing energy out and getting it, you know, it's a Doppler radar. So when it's in search mode, that's all it's doing. It's going, oh, I can see you, I can see you. And it's yeah. looking for a return. So he gets a return. So he wants to see what it is because all you get is a little green square unless it builds a track file on it. But the little green square is just sitting there. It's not moving because it's, it's sitting in one spot in space. He locks it up. When he goes to lock it up, now he's putting a bunch of energy on it. Yeah. But he's telling the radar, stare down that line of sight, and whatever's there, I want you to grab it and build a track file on it, which will tell us how high it is, how fast it is, and the direction that it's going. Okay? The radar's smart enough that when the signal comes back, if it's been messed with, it will tell you, it'll give you indications that I'm being jammed. So that's all it is, is you send the signal out, something, it manipulates the signal, either in range and velocity or whatever, and it sends it back, and the radar was smart enough to go that is not a return that I'm expecting. Something's messing Something's with me, I'm weird. being jammed. And it shows you and it puts strobes up, it gives these lines on the radar and it does some stuff. So you can immediately, well it does, it goes full into, it, it's being jammed in about every mode you can possibly see because everything comes up and the, the this aspect gets long, it's all kinds of, I don't want to get into details, but you can tell it's being jammed. So you notice Commander Fravor is basically talking around words, it's because this is all classified, okay? So it's all classified information on what our radars are experiencing when we come upon jamming. Okay, vulnerabilities in the radar is what it, what it shows. There's three ways to track a target, essentially. You send out radar energy, and you can time how long the radar comes back, the radar energy, right? It, it's light speed there, light speed back, you can time it. That tells you range. So that's basically tracking something with range. You can track something in angle as well, okay? So like I mentioned with targeting pods, I mentioned they're very good at angle. Well, ra radars are the same. They can also tell wavefront, et cetera. So it can tell exactly the angle that's going off, okay? So it can use that to track in angle, right? So, so far we have tracks in range, tracks in angle. And then the third way to track, this was a newer, is Doppler. Third way to track is actually velocity shift. So when the actual radar energy hits the aircraft or object, if the object is moving now, it will impart an actual Doppler shift into the little actual pulse of the radar. The radar can measure that Doppler shift now and determine how fast it's going. So that's how we measure something in velocity. We're tracking it basically in three ways, range, angle, and velocity. 
So that's how they're tracking it. Fravor then mentions how all those things show up. So when he says they get the strobes along the radar, the strobes basically means is noise jamming. What, I, what I'm considering that is going to be noise jamming where it's just denying most things, okay? You can do range gate pull-offs. There's different techniques that deceive radars in range. So what he's talking about is what'll happen is it looks like the aircraft is getting, the actual track is getting closer. So it'll actually change. It'll change speed. Okay, so you'll see the actual speed of it change as well as direct velocity um, velocity programs that they're gonna trick the radar in that Doppler shift. They're gonna mess with that Doppler shift to change the radar. And that'll give different indi indications on the radar. He mentions that basically everything was showing up, okay? And what we'll notice is on the targeting pod, because we don't get indications, this is all on the radar, it's probably gonna be classified for a lot of the reasons I just mentioned. But on the targeting pod now, what you'll see is that range indication. Normally we're expecting to get some range to this thing and all we see is 99.9 range and he relates later in the interview that that denotes jamming and that makes sense to me it's basically just going to show that can't get range and that 99.9 shows that it is actually being jammed so final point here that commander fravor will go through when he's talking about the actual engagement that chad underwood had is how chad got the lock and this will give you just some general essay general idea of how it works how he actually physically locked up the Tic Tac without getting good radar information. Okay, so we'll watch through that now. And then in the back seat, so they don't have a stick and throttle, they have what their side stick controllers so they can control all the sensors mm -hmm. and they can just toggle around and do stuff. So he can he has the ability to just move one switch real quick and it will go from that azimuth elevation on the radar to the targeting pod. Well, as soon as he commanded the radar to look at that target, the targeting pod goes, oh, what's over there? And it'll stare because it goes down the line of sight because all the systems are hooked together. You can decouple them, but they're going to automatically couple up. So when he castles over, he, it's a switch, it looks like a castle switch. Was a castle. So when he moves that thing to the left and he swaps the displays out and he says, instead of looking at the radar, I want to look at the targeting pod, he sees it on the targeting pod because the targeting pod's already looking there. Mm -hmm. And now he's on a passive track because he's not literally sending any energy out. He's just receiving IR energy from the Tic Tac. Yep. And then the system itself will track the pixels and the contrast differences. Yep. It depends yep. on what mode you're in. So it says, oh, and that's where those little bars you see in the video where the bars come up left and right. doing some vi vision-based tracking. That's exactly what it is. Um, yep. So And, and, then and that's the video. He goes through. Changes Chad, zooms, changes the he mode. Change, he goes through all the modes. So there's a narrow, medium, and wide. So wide is far away, medium, and then narrow. And then there's the TV mode, and he goes from IR mode to the TV mode. The cool thing with the TV mode is narrow IR mode is only medium TV mode. So you can actually get closer with narrow TV mode. It's got a better zoom capability when you go into TV mode. Um, so he goes through all those things. And that's when you see it going from yeah. a black background to a white background. He's trying to figure out what the heck is this? Well, yeah, and he wants to get as much data as he can on it based on the different modes instead of just staring at it going, what is that thing? Yeah. There's a couple key points there. The first is, Fravor talks about the tracking on the radar. Okay, so when your radar is in a search mode, if you'll notice the radar is just going back, there's a little line that goes back and forth. Okay, that's a mechanically scanned radar. Now they go to electronically scanned, so you're not going to have that. But in the, in the older day, in the olden days, we had a mechanically scanned radar, right? So that thing's going back and forth, uh, and it's, it's in a search mode. Okay, so often you will get hits, specific hits out of things out there, objects out there. But you can't, it's not accurate enough to shoot a missile at it or to get any really good information on it. So what happens is you will command the actual radar to stare at that point in space. So it'll stare at that location along that azimuth and just send tons of radar energy down there. It's basically like a spotlight. We call it a spotlight. You spotlight with your flashlight, you're trying to get more energy back. Well, normally if, if there's a jammer out there that actually knows what it's doing, it can detect this additional increase in energy to know that it's been detected. And so now it will take that energy and now it will turn on and effectively jam the radar that is sending energy towards its way, right? And so Underwood, from my understanding, from what uh, Fravor says, he never got a full radar lock. So he basically sees the hits on the radar, and when he goes to command that spotlight, what happens is the targeting pod also angles along that same line of sight. And what you can do is, if you are being jammed, is look in your targeting pod, and now you can see that it's, it is passively tracked. If you can get a track with the targeting pod, now we can passively track something. Uh, as far as the cap points, to me, it seems weird, but you'll see that they use these all the time. This is a common training area. So for me, it implies that 
the Tic Tacs were aware, or whatever it is, were aware of our general training patterns and knew that they were going to that area or that position often. That's how in that airspace, maybe that's where the planes go. Or it was just coincidence. As far as the jamming, initially I thought it was just changing the energy that the radar was sending out and the radar was misreading it as jamming. But Fravor mentions they saw all types of jamming. So if it is doing that, it is screwing up the radar in many different ways. Basically it's, it's convincing the radar or at least cueing the radar to range gate pull off techniques. So um, discrepancies in range discrepancies in angle and discrepancies in that, that Doppler shift. So, I don't know, could be planned jamming, or at any rate, it is really screwing up that radar signal that's going out there. And then finally, hopefully you learned something about how the actual radar works, how that uh, search and track modes of the radar are gonna change your energy output, and then how Chad Underwood was still able to lock this thing up in uh, with the targeting pod. So he did a great job. He went out there, did exactly what he said he was gonna do, and get video of this thing for us. So thanks to Chad Underwood, thanks to Dave Fravor, uh, Alex Teacher for speaking up about this very, very important uh, engagement. Thanks for watching everybody. Thanks to my patrons. Please hit that like button if you like this content so I can get more of it out there for you guys. And have a great week. See ya, peace.